Good afternoon. My cell phone says it's 1.15, so I'm going to proceed. Uh, I'm John Adair. I am one of the neurologists with the uh, Center for Memory and Aging at the University of New Mexico. And I greatly appreciate the opportunity to represent that group at the conference. And I will be talking about uh, aducanumab, otherwise known as aduhelm, uh, the medication that was recently approved. Dr. DeVoos mentioned this earlier. But I'll be talking about possibilities in the future. Um, these are tremendous innovations, and I'll explain why I say that, but they have a number of caveats that people need to understand. There are a number of questions that are still unanswered. So the use of these medications will be a work in progress for the near future. To give uh, some perspective, ooh, I'd like to advance my slides. How about that? Hmm, Nicolette, uh, oh, there we go. I just didn't push the right button. To give some perspective, I want to start by uh, talking about something people may already know about, and those are the medications we've used for Alzheimer's disease for a number of years. This was uh, a limited group of medications until June. Um, and they break into two classes. There are medications that increase a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. And for those of you, uh, neurotransmitters are chemicals that are released from one cell onto the other to pass messages within the nervous system. And the drugs that increase acetylcholine are donepezil, rivastigmine, and galantamine. Those are the generic names. And galantamine was the most recently approved of the cholinesterase inhibitors 20 years ago. One other drug in its own class is a, a medication that blocks the neurotransmitter glutamate. And it's called memantine or nemenda. And it was approved approximately 18 years ago. And these are the tools we've had in our box. There are not a lot of options. Um, the other issue is that all these medications are literally old enough to vote. What do I mean by that? Well, the last approval was 18 years ago. And this slide gives you some idea of how treatment for Alzheimer's disease is lagged behind uh, innovations in treatment of other neurologic disorders. You have four exemplary disorders, Alzheimer's disease on the left, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, and epilepsy. Now, this slide is dated. I think I gave the talk back in 2015. But you can see three different five-year epics in which there were the drugs rivastigmine, galantamine, and memantine introduced. Three drugs just in that time period, which is now 18 years ago. You can see the other diseases have had a number of new therapies introduced since then. So a question people might ask validly is, you know, what's the problem here? Why are we lagging so far behind in finding better treatments for Alzheimer's disease? Oops. Um, the other points to make is the currently available medications are not approved for people in the earliest stages of the process. Dr. Dabu uh, referred to these earlier stages and they're under the term mild cognitive impairment. Before June, the medications that were approved for Alzheimer's disease were used in people with mild, moderate, or severe Alzheimer's disease. They had to meet criteria for dementia. People with mild cognitive impairment are 
prior to meeting criteria for dementia. So these medications didn't really apply. They may have been used for mild cognitive impairment, but they weren't approved. That wasn't the focus. The other major point is that these are uh, drugs that did not address the biological processes going on inside the brain of somebody with Alzheimer's disease. They boost up or block chemicals without really changing the process that injures nerve cells inside the brain. Again, why the lag? Well, you know, obstacles to finding effective treatments for Alzheimer's at least partly relate to our incomplete knowledge about what causes nerve cell injury. Tremendous amounts of research have gone into this, uh, some of which was summarized in the last talk. Um, but what we'll focus on, because we're talking about aducanumab, is one part of the complex process, and that is this protein Dr. DeVu mentioned earlier, amyloid. And without going into mind-numbing details, amyloid is a protein that you're actually producing inside your brain as we speak. It has a physiologic process. And it is broken down from a larger protein called APP. Two or three different enzymes release a smaller fragment. This is the amyloid beta peptide, which uh, depending upon the size, winds up aggregating into small clumps, which lead to bigger clumps. Again, the amyloid deposition in these clumps is thought to have something to do with tau starting to uh, malfunction. But there have been several strategies attempted to modify the amount of amyloid inside the brain. One strategy were to inhibit enzymes that cleave the APP, reducing the production of the amyloid beta protein. Another attempt was made at keeping amyloid from clumping together. The strategy I'll focus on today is trying to eliminate amyloid from the brain using immune mechanisms. Uh, there is at least one other theoretical means of reducing amyloid, and that's to reduce its clearance from the brain. Those uh, strategies are in very early stages of development. One of the ways that this field has advanced is by using animal models of the disease process. You can create uh, Alzheimer's disease inside a mouse. Again, what they do is take the gene or amyloid and inject it into uh, mouse eggs, then take those eggs that are now fertilized and put them inside a surrogate mother who carries the babies to term. This is a grown baby. And what the slide shows is inside their brain, you can see the uh, abnormalities that you see in a human brain. Well, this may seem somewhat cruel and I appreciate the arguments for and against animal models, but the use of uh, mice has, uh, greatly uh, increased the ability to research disease because they reach maturity and then old age within about 18 months. Uh, if you were using cats, that process would take 10 years. If you were using non-human primates, it might take 30 or 40 years. So you can see these changes within a short period of time. And this has been a very useful model to look at the causes, the mechanisms, but also potential treatments. 
Now, aducanumab was approved about four or five months ago, but the immunization strategy for removing amyloid is actually an old idea. The uh, first paper mentioning this came out in the late 1990s. Um, what researchers did uh, was conjecture. What would happen if we injected amyloid protein into the mouse model? Their hypothesis would be that the mouse would make an immune response to the protein, and this might allow elimination of amyloid from the brains. Sorry about the kind of scientific slide again, but let me just break it down. This axis measures how much amyloid is inside the mouse's brain. These are untreated control mice at middle age. They don't have much amyloid. This is mouse placebo, PBS. And you can see by 15 months, the mouses who were treated with placebo have some deposition of amyloid. Those that received amyloid immunization had much lower burdens of amyloid. And they, at later ages, that separation increases. The mouse placebo had a tremendous burden of amyloid, whereas the mice that received the immunization had much less amyloid deposited inside their brain. Now, when I read this paper, I thought two things. First, this guy, uh, Dale Shank, will be getting a Nobel Prize in the next 10 years. Uh, the second thing was I need to find out what company he works for and invest heavily in it. This was a tremendous breakthrough, uh, unexpected in, in my mind. So what's the next step? They tried giving amyloid injected into humans, the first medication was called AN1792. And these trials were uh, conducted during the middle part of the 1990s. And as I'll get back to, um, the measures showing improvement in people's function and cognition did not show improvement. However, a uh, number of the participants in the study generously donated their brains at autopsy. And they could look at autopsy brains from individuals in the study who did not receive the immunization. What this shows, again, is plaque density. You can make that the same as amyloid density or burden. The single vaccinated patient is the black diamond. And these are different areas inside the brain. And it's pretty easy to see that in most areas, there was much less amyloid inside the brain at autopsy compared to those who did not receive the immunization. What's the problem then besides the fact that it didn't make people better? Well, this particular preparation caused a brain reaction encephalitis in 8% of the people receiving vaccination. This uh, brain MRI uh, demonstrates uh, these abnormalities, which we'll get back to in a second. But the developers of the initial strategy decided it wasn't worth pursuing further. So by the end of uh, that, we had to step back and say, is this strategy going to cause too many side effects? Again, this cartoon mentions a, a person, and you may have experienced this yourself, where people did not want to take the medication because it was worse than the disease being treated. The field evolved. We'll talk about how many trials have been done in a second. And the way uh, it evolved, again, people didn't abandon the strategy. There was good news and bad news. Again, there was some evidence of clinical benefits in later trials. But with all amyloid reduction strategies, people developed this 
form of encephalitis. So people kept going back to the drawing board. They developed a different strategy. Instead of injecting the protein amyloid they, into humans, they injected it into animals and got the antibodies out of them. And more recently, they are able to make a monoclonal antibody that will combine the antibody from the mouse with part of an antibody from a human, making them even more compatible with treatment. The other thing, I don't wanna bore you too much, but the amyloid molecule has, uh, it's, it's got a string of amino acids and the different antibodies being developed target some at some sites and others at different parts of the molecule. That's a detail I don't want to belabor, but there have been many different approaches to vaccinating Alzheimer disease. These are, I believe, the comprehensive list of the monoclonal antibody immunizations that have been tried over about the last 15 years. Down at the bottom are aducanumab, and I misspelled the one Dr. Davu mentions, donanimab. And again, they share this property of clearing amyloid from the brain, but all of them did not meet the standard set by the researchers for clinical improvement. And because of that, were largely abandoned. This gives an idea of just how hard it is to get a medication to market, so to speak. And Dr. Davu mentioned different phases of drug development. In phase one, after you've proven some efficacy and safety inside your animal model, you give it to healthy humans to mainly see if it's safe. And only about a quarter of medications that seem to work in animals make it even to the first phase. The second phase is used in humans with the disease primarily to establish safety. They also look at measures of efficacy. By that, I mean whether it helps people clinically. And you can see that only 8% make it from this original 28%. And again, over this time period, um, there's a very small fraction that actually get to the pharmacy shelves. And this represents a very small fraction of all the medications tried. This quote from the paper is that the overall success rate for approval of new Alzheimer's therapy is 0.4%. And they contrast that with other types of treatments, such as cancer, where the rate of getting to the pharmacy shelves from the laboratory is 19%, or roughly 80 times uh, more likely than new medications for Alzheimer's disease. So why did this strategy, which seemed to eliminate amyloid from brains and humans, not make a big difference in how they were doing clinically? The first idea, which came up maybe halfway down the list of medications I showed you that were rejected, was that this idea that amyloid was important in causing injury to nerve cells was wrong. And there was tremendous consternation in the research field and a uh, move towards uh, looking at uh, whether targeting the tau protein Dr. Davu mentioned might be more worthwhile. There's a possibility that when we do clinical trials and we test whether it helps people, that these tests are just not adequate for capturing any improvement. This is a tough uh, 
question, uh, but the trials use multiple ways of looking at people. Are they able to remember them? Are they having fewer behavioral symptoms? Are they able to do more at home? And I think the tools we have right now will be adequate, certainly for a medication that makes a big difference. The third reason to mention why they may not work is that uh, concept that Dr. Debu mentioned, um, all the, uh, the first 12 of the medications I showed you took the same approach that was used for donepezil and menantine studying patients in mild to moderate stages of the disease. As Dr. Dubu mentioned, because tau may be well established by that time, eliminating amyloid may, be too, may have been too late to improve the outcome of patients it was given to. The other possibility, which gets back to that complex process where amyloid is only one part of the story, um, may be another reason these medications have been less than impressive in terms of their clinical effect. It is likely possible that amyloid em elimination will need to be combined with other strategies to uh, improve the uh, utility of these new medications. But as you've seen, uh, early June, the FDA granted approval for aducanumab. And there have been a number of articles subsequent to this in which people were both enthusiastic, but also somewhat condemning uh, the process by which it was approved. So why was aducanumab approved? Dr. Debu showed this slide in a different form. Aducanumab was uh, uh, studied in two different trials. This is study 301. And what the graphic shows you is that the trends for treatment were in the right direction, but there was really not a big difference. They do not show the placebo bar um, between giving someone an inert uh, treatment, a placebo, and the outcome measure. These are cognitive outcome measures. This looks at activities of daily living. So like the prior anti-amyloid therapies, this looked like aducanumab might be headed for uh, the uh, list of medications that would be rejected again. There was another study though, 302, in which there was a signal uh, this is a, a slide from a presentation at the American Academy of Neurology. And it says that the highest dose of aducanumab met all clinical endpoints addressing cognition and function by about a year and a half. The fact is the primary endpoint, this is one cognitive measure, really did not differ in a statistically significant way from placebo. Um, in general, the uh, uh, science approves or thinks that the hypothesis is true if there is less than a one in 20 chance that the results were simply from chance. These values for that statistical significance were not that low. These other endpoints did show that they were statistically significantly different than placebo. Um, the issue uh, is that these endpoints, these scales, um, range over a uh, interval and the actual improvements 
are relatively small increments on that interval. But there was at least some signal that this medication had some clinically important event, um, outcome results. The real reason aducanumab was approved was that as Dr. DeVu showed earlier, the medication reduced amyloid inside the brain. Notice, this is the same thing that was proven with AN1792 over 20 years ago. They did not have the PET scans. They had to look at autopsies, but now using radial ligands that bind to amyloid, you can look at amyloid deposition without an autopsy. And what you see here on the left are individuals scans at baseline and after one year, in this case, in people who did not receive the active treatment. The subsequent rows show different doses of aducanumab. And you can see that there is a dose-related improvement in how much amyloid is inside the brain of the people receiving it. This graphic displays the same information. Placebo did not reduce at all, whereas different doses showed a reduction in amyloid inside the brain. And this was really the thing that got the FDA's attention, mainly because they had changed the way they approached drug approval over the years. There was a new a way of getting drugs approved that goes back almost 30 years. It's called accelerated approval. And um, this process is used for drugs that address serious conditions that fill an unmet medical need. Certainly Alzheimer's would qualify, but they're approved on a surrogate endpoint likely to predict clinical benefit. That surrogate endpoint is amyloid reduction. So in the approval, in this accelerated approval, they did not determine that the drug is safe and clinically effective. What the FDA is doing is betting that this medication, which reduces amyloid, will eventually lead to better outcomes. So this accelerated approval process has been very useful. Um, initially, some of the conditions under which medications were approved were HIV, again, there was a tremendous unmet need, and cancer. And in those conditions, there were surrogate endpoints that tracked very closely with how well someone was doing clinically. So when one receives an accelerated approval, as Dr. DeVu mentions, the law calls for them to do uh, follow-up studies or collect follow-up information that either confirms or refutes that this approval was correct. And what you can see is that between uh, 1992 and 2020, all, of all the drugs given accelerated approval, most of them remained on the market. Most of them were. Only 6% were withdrawn after having a confirmatory or refuting study completed. The other thing this paper mentions is that only about 10% of drugs that have been uh, approved through this accelerated process, followed through with studies that um, confirm or refute its usefulness. And so there are drugs out there, presumably the studies are still pending, but the process of determining the utility under this accelerated approval is, is perhaps not as stringent as 
we would like it to be. But aducanumab will be studied after it's given to individuals from a pharmacy in a clinic. And time will tell whether eliminating the amyloid is going to make people better over the long run. So what are the downsides? Well, like every other immunization strategy, all anti-amyloid therapies show that patients' blood vessels can become leaky. Without going into the details, amyloid is also deposited inside the blood vessels of people with Alzheimer's disease. And eliminating it through vaccination undermines the integrity of the smaller blood vessels. And you can have amyloid-related imaging abnormalities. This slide demonstrates two different types. Uh, the red circle uh, is around some dark spots, which represent leaking of blood into the tissue. Now, these are very small. There's also leaking of water, which is pointed out here, this white area where the arrows are. Here's a bigger patch that looks a lot like what I showed you uh, earlier for AN1792. So all anti-amyloid strategies likely will cause this problem. How big of a problem is it? Well, this Amyloid-related imaging abnormality, or area, is usually not symptomatic. Again, it's a complex table, but this shows the highest dose of aducanumab and placebo. Note how placebo people will also occasionally demonstrate similar MRI imaging abnormalities. Note also that it's four times more likely, almost half the people with the highest dose of aducanumab. Fortunately, only about one-fifth of the people who had the amyloid-related imaging abnormalities had any type of symptoms. They can be mild, headache, uh, dizziness, or they can be serious, including uh, worsening of mental status, falls, seizures, and what look like strokes. And again, this happens in placebo, but you are roughly 20 times more likely if you're receiving the higher dose of aducanumab to develop symptoms from these leaky blood vessels. Other downsides. Well, there are financial considerations. Uh, we do not live in a perfect world. And the current estimated cost of one year treatment with the medication for the medication itself has been quoted as $56,000 a year. As Dr. Drew mentioned, CMS is considering whether they will underwrite any or all of the cost of this medication. Our hope for those who want to uh, use this medication is that they will approve at least some of the cost of the medication. But this paper I found made a statement where even if Medicare approved 80% of the coverage of the medication, the remaining out-of-pocket cost would equate to about a quarter of median household wealth note for black older adults. The actual thrust of this paper was to point out that we really do not know that it works in groups besides Caucasians. And that's not aducanumab's fault. That's a, something the research uh, community has been struggling with for a long time. But we frankly don't know until this additional information is collected if and how it works for other ethnic groups. So at this point, with a little bit of clinical improvement at best, treatment with aducanumab may be a lot of squeezing for just a little bit of juice. 
there are collateral costs. These may not be covered by any type of insurance. It is likely that the uh, use under, um, uh, it's called, they're trying to determine best practices will require that the patients receiving aducanumab have MRIs that they would not get otherwise. These are surveillance looking for any signs of blood vessel leakage. And the current proposals are following what was done in the clinical trial. So brain MRI was done after the first six months and then uh, approximately six months later. It is possible that insurance companies won't co cover that cost. It is likely also uh, uh, the case that people designing or uh, recommendations for best use will ask people to demonstrate that they have amyloid deposition inside the brain. Now that is something I do not use a lot in clinical practice. We do do these in the service of research. The one reason I don't do it in clinical practice is that the PET scan detecting amyloid is quite expensive. We can also measure amyloid inside cerebrospinal fluid. This is much less expensive, but requires a lumbar puncture, which many people cannot have or don't want to have. But this cost of demonstrating amyloid before starting the therapy will be another burden potentially that is not met by insurance coverage. Um, if people decide that the best way to use aducanumab is to demonstrate reduction of amyloid with a second PET scan, that cost is doubled. Besides the medication, the amyloid scan, the MRIs, there's the cost of infusions, and these are relatively low and will likely be covered by insurance, but that's still uncertain as well. Lastly, there will likely be a lot of extra clinical visits, either to the emergency room or the outpatient clinic for any new symptom that develops in someone who's taking it aducanumab. And until more experience is gained, my suspicion is that if you are taking aducanumab and you get a headache, I will tell you to go to the emergency room and get another MRI. And whether these costs will be covered by insurance is still up in the air. So the total cost yearly of giving aducanumab is going to be more than $56,000 a year. And some estimates have put it as high as $100,000 a year. Again, people are developing what is called appropriate use criteria. This is still a work in progress. Um, there are experts that are trying to reach consensus on taking the methods used in the clinical trial and applying them in the outpatient clinics. They will be followed, uh, the recommendations will probably follow closely to the methods used in clinical trials. So one point is that people who are eligible for aducanumab will be in the very earliest stages of Alzheimer's disease. Now, this includes mild cognitive impairment, which represents an advance over the currently approved drugs. Um, it's also true that perhaps um, a third of the patients, maybe even more, that I see in clinic would not be approved because they're too far along. The other thing is likely that only patients who can have brain MRIs should be taking this medication. This has to do with the surveillance MRIs looking for the amyloid-related imaging abnormalities. They cannot be seen on CAT scan. And many people cannot have MRIs for various reasons. A common one is that they've got a cardiac pacemaker. You'll also have to demonstrate 
amyloid deposition, which as I showed in the previous slide, will add some additional expense. I suspect there may be doctors who, with the approval, will just go ahead and treat amyloid or Alzheimer's based on their clinical impression. Um, that's a valid strategy once a drug is approved. The appropriate use criteria may be uh, the template against which CMS, Medicare, other insurance companies decide this is the way to do it. And you need to have the amyloid documented, even if we won't pay for your PET scan. Lastly, there are a number of patients in which they should not receive aducanumab because they have a bleeding tendency. Commonly, people are on anticoagulants for one condition or another, and they are likely going to be excluded from the use of aducanumab. So to summarize, it's exciting that we have a new drug, the first in 18 years. And it is likely also true that the strategy is here to stay, at least for the near future. Additional information will be collected, but that will take a number of years to confirm or refute whether the FDA was correct in approving it through this accelerated process. We know Don Animab has already submitted a request for consideration at FDA. But keep in mind, again, only 10% of drugs receiving accelerated approval um, with that have, have still not been confirmed as clinically effective. And the same thing may happen with these medications. Uncertainties remain. Risk seems relatively low. Benefit is still, uh, it may be very modest. Again, we're betting on elimination of amyloid now, uh, meaning that the patient will be better than they would be otherwise in five to 10 years. That's a difficult risk benefit calculation. The only thing that seems certain is that this will uh, represent a tremendous financial burden, if not to people, then to um, society at large. There are people who are willing to commit uh, any sort of resources in an attempt to help patients and families, but we want to also use this medication in people who are not millionaires. Um, there are both ethical issues and scientific issues to try to make it available regardless of how much financial burden it represents. I'd like to stop there, see if there are any questions. I guess um, Nicolette will ask if there are any in the chat box. Yes, Dr. Adair. Actually, we don't have any that came into the chat box, but we can um, do a little call to action right now with any participants that are on. If you have a question for Dr. Adair, now is the time to go ahead and enter it into the chat box. It'll pop up and then I can read that to him and he can get that answered for you. So we'll give a few minutes for that. Sure. They can't unmute, unfortunately. Huh? Correct. It is in webinar um, mode. So sorry about that. Not able to unmute. Damn Zoom conference. <laughs> Maybe next year. And for those of you who are maybe unfamiliar with um, the Zoom platform, the chat box is um, at the bottom of your screen. It's going to be um, the, looks like the fifth or sixth box um, in, and it's kind of in the middle next to the share your screen. Let's see. There looks like there's a question that came in from Derek Pino. If you have any additional questions. Um, oh, I'm sorry. No, yeah, Derek Pino is with, with um, your organization with UNM. So he's just directing people to go to the booth um, that you guys do have in the exhibit hall. That's a great point, um, Derek. Yes, so UNM does, uh, Center for Memory and Aging does have their own booth in the exhibit hall that if anyone has follow-up questions, they can definitely um, go to the booth, kind of poke around there, see what resources and information you guys have there, but also connect directly with, with you all. They will also likely have um, the newsletter that uh, 
a group just put out and uh, one of my partners, Dr. Knofel, has a small editorial talking about some of the issues I mentioned. I'm just hoping I didn't bore people too much. But oh, I absolutely not. I think, <laughs> out the issue. I think we were all very um, enthralled by the presentation. I know I was just glued to my screen. Um, a lot <laughs> of it is stuff that we don't get to hear all the time, even though we work in this industry. So um, it was very, um, very good. Thank you, Dr. Adair. Sure. I'll linger for a while if you want. Sure. Yes, well, we have about another minute um, to get any questions in and then the webinar will end and um, attendees can make their way to their next session, which I believe will begin at 2.15. Uh, seem like there's any questions coming in, um, Doctor. So we'll go ahead and end the webinar. We thank you for your time and for your expertise in this area for presenting here today. And we also thank all the attendees um, during this session. And we'll we'll see you in the next one. Thank you all. <laughs>